Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Um, good to see everybody here. Looks like Rose is here, Nora's here. Knowledge is free. What's up, uh, Sarbajit? Good to have you. Um, Anka, we have the French Leo. Hi. Um, Somi. Wow, there's so many people here today. This is awesome. Um, thank you guys for being here, and I apologize for being a little bit late today. Um, I am the director of Spokane College of English Language here in Spokane, Washington, USA. And I have a, um, an important meeting with another college uh, right after this class, and I have to drive to our neighboring state of Idaho. Spokane is right near the border of Idaho. Um, it's on the eastern side of Washington State. And so I had to prepare a bunch of things for the college here um, to leave right after. And, uh, and it was difficult to drive here because the, the snow is, I mean, snow is everywhere here in Spokane. It is beautiful. It is so gorgeous. But it is difficult to travel in, too. Um, so. Uh, to the class. Welcome everybody. Glad to have you here. I'm just checking the chat and make sure that uh, Thank you for wishing me well in my new year. Um, I appreciate that uh, Hirata looks like Steve good to have you here good to um, Know that you're happy to hear my voice uh, Okay All right, Nadia from Argentina. Hello. How are you? Okay, so I'm gonna get right to it we discussed earlier, um, last class, in preparing for this English for academic purposes, the fact that we're going to um, we're going to talk about um, different aspects of academic English, but that doesn't mean that we can't have fun with it too. Um, someone had mentioned it might have been Nora, I I can't recall, or Mona. Somebody had said um, that they wanted to look at slang vocabulary. Well, we do have slang classes we offer here at the college. Um, they offer in Vancouver, um, Canada. We also, by the way, hi to Amy in Vancouver, Canada, if you're there. Um, and we, we do those classes, but this is an academic English class. So, since that was a request of our students, I still wanted to somehow make it work, right? Um, so I thought, well, let's look at the comparisons between academic vocabulary and slang because they have synonyms, right? And maybe you have learned one of the words but not the other and it will make more sense to you if you can sort of associate a slang vocabulary word with um, an academic vocabulary word. Now, it's important that we understand something about synonyms first. Um, I want you to understand that synonyms are not perfect one-for-one -one replacements. There are, there are no synonyms in the English language. That's the way I explain it to my students, and that sounds confusing. But what I mean by that is um, every word exists because it has a unique meaning. Now, some are very close, and some have similar meaning. That's, that's why we say synonyms, right? Similar. Um, can help you remember, hopefully. Similar meaning does not mean exactly the same. So students who say, oh, a synonym is a word with the same meaning. Not really. A synonym is a word with similar meaning. Similar is just near the same meaning, but not exact, okay? So, um, I'm just making sure I'm answering your questions in the chat here as we're going. Um, all right. Egypt, hello. Good to have you. Um, Bodo's back. All right. So, I'm going to get right into this. Um, I just wanted to recap some of the new information we have. So, Jeremy posted on our Learn English on Facebook group, which is awesome. I was on there yesterday chatting, having some great conversations with students. I just posted that in the chat. Um, we have, oh, okay. <laughs> we have a few questions here, and we're starting to ask about word meaning, which is good. Rosa says, uh, she asks, how can American slang affect students? 
Um, you'd have to be a little more precise in your question there, Rosa. Um, if your question is, why would we teach American slang? Um, how can it affect an academic student? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Not all of your information that you gather um, from sources is going to be credible, but some of the information might be casually beneficial to get a holistic view of um, the topic at hand. For example, let's say you were writing about um, global warming, uh, climate change, right? You were writing about governments needing to invest more time and money into addressing climate change. Um, it's a big important thing for all of us all over the world. So if you're writing a paper to, um, to argue why governments should um, fund climate change more, you might get most of your sources from um, scientific journals, um, publications that are uh, governmental or otherwise, but you might also be able to learn a lot about the subject in general from casual um, references in, in cinema, in, in television, in YouTube. Now, you shouldn't take everything you hear as truth, of course, but you might need some of the slang words or phrases or idioms to understand. Here's an example. Climate change is talking about the increase and decrease of temperatures and how that affects human life, right? Um, well, if someone is in a part of the world where it wasn't previously really, really, really hot in the summer and then it is really, really hot, a casual American English speaker would say, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like a sauna in here. Now, you might know what that means, you might not, um, but that is a very common idiomatic phrase in English. It's like a sauna in here means it feels very hot. Um, so that is one way that it might affect us. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna get right to the vocab and then we're gonna start talking about it. I think I've addressed everybody's um, question. Uh, oh, somebody asked about a slang word earlier. Um, munted, I think. I uh, don't know that word, but I can look it up. Uh, it looks like it's primarily a British slang word that means um, to be intoxicated. So, um, acting like an idiot after becoming intoxicated is what that means. Uh, okay. Rosa says, thank you. You are very welcome, Rosa. Rosa is one of our premium subscribers. Um, oh, we have another Rosa now, too. Rosa from Italy. Uh, oh, okay. Rosa from Italy says, this class is too difficult, but she wanted to say hi. Well, hello. Um, Hello, Rosa. Other Rosa. Um, so this class is too difficult for you. That's totally fine. We do have a lot of other really good classes. Um, I'm going to bring those up for you right now, actually, so that you can see. Um, so Rosa, if you go to that link, you'll be able to see some of our other um, some of our other classes that we offer, and I'll bring them up right here for you as well um, in just a second. But I just want to talk about the changes that have happened this new year because of popular demand, because of what students want. We listen to students. I mean, look at today's class. I'm teaching slang and um, academic English words by comparison um, because a student asked, and we want to. Um, go over the English that you need, which is important. Um, if all of you know how to do APA formatting, it doesn't make sense for me to teach a bunch of APA formatting. Um, but if a lot of you ask questions about it, we teach those classes, which is great. So um, due to popular demand, we've changed the subscription price. It's gone down um, to save you guys a little bit. It's $35 a month. And we have one class per week. Um, previously, it was a little bit more, and we were doing two classes. Uh, but this is what students want, so this is what we want to give them. Um, you get a free month trial. So Rosa from Italy, if you um, have not uh, tried it out, give it a shot. You get a free month, no, no obligation at all. 
Um, you get an hour lesson a week with either a Canadian or an American teacher, and all the teachers are amazing, I can tell you. Um, you get access to the courses on SMART, you get teacher marked assignments, quizzes, exams, and official SMART certification at the end. Um, so here is our schedule um, right here. So we have um, Abby's class, pre-intermediate English. We have Sean's class, which is coming up tomorrow. Really excited, Sean's an amazing teacher. Neil and this guy. Um, so that is the schedule, that's the link I put in the chat. And here's our Learn English on Facebook page, which I posted earlier. Um, so there's lots of fun, cool stuff on there as well. Um, if you're not uh, a member of the group, request to join and we can get you in there. So I'm gonna go to the main event right now, the lesson. We're gonna look at lists of academic English vocabulary. So to do this, I'm going to take attendance for our premium subscribers. I know Rose is here, Sarbajit's here. Um, looks like Aaron and some are logged on. I haven't seen any comments. Um, Vivek, it's good to have you here as well, always. Zaid. Um, so we had a question about much and many. That's a lower level question, um, but sometimes it helps to review. You might benefit from um, perhaps uh, Neil's class or Abby's class that might help refresh a little bit on the grammar. But um, many is for countable nouns and much is for uncountable nouns. They're used in um, questions and negatives, rarely affirmative sentences. So if you're not sure what affirmative means, check out one of those other classes, okay? Um, all right, we can't use it at the end. Though is commonly used at the end of sentences in casual English. Um, I avoid it in academic writing myself. Sometimes it's a matter of stylistics. Um, all right. Oh, Rosa knows everything. She's waiting for a class tomorrow with Sean. That's awesome. Very good. Um, okay. Uh, Steve says, Rosa was right. We don't put it at the end of a sentence. Like I said, I, I do not do that in academic writing. I use that often in casual language. So we have formal English, which is, is academic writing, usually, using proper syntax and grammar and mechanical structure. Then we have um, world English, right? Useful English, Facebook English, which can be super casual. Um, and then we have conversational English, which we do certain things in speech that we do not in writing and vice versa. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of those nuances. So I'm just gonna take attendance here for our premium subscribers. And there we go. Um, and then we're gonna go over some of these vocab words. So I brought up our previous um, vocabulary list. We were talking about poverty. Uh, we've gone over this earlier, but if you're a new student or if you just need a refresher on some of these words, we can do that for you. Um, so we have uh, words like adequately. Adequately is an adverb and it means well enough, right? I adequately cleaned the carpet. I cleaned it well enough. I cleaned it to an appropriate cleanliness level, right? Um, but I'm going to ask the chat for a couple of words. Can you give me suggestions of slang, phrases, idioms, synonyms, words that are similar that would have the same meaning or carry the same meaning in a sentence? I'm going to go over this whole list here really quickly, like four or five, um, just kind of picking over the whole list and then ask if we have synonyms, okay? And then if we can't think of one in the chat, um, I'll offer one for you, okay? So adequately means like well enough, right? It's like an okay amount. Um, all right, let's see. Um, expenditures, expenditures. So expenditures is, uh, expenditures is a word that means the amount of money or the, um, the purpose for spending money in an allotted time. So monthly expenditures are, um, items that you have to spend money on each month. Okay. 
Let's see. Um, I can give you Zach's email if you like, or you can message him on Facebook. So that's Zach's email, um, just to help you out a little bit there. So can you think of expenses, Nora says? Yeah, yeah, expenses, expenditures, um, those are similar words. Let's think of, of heavy slang though, slang phrases that you may have heard. You know, think Netflix, YouTube, that sort of thing. These are all academic words that I'm showing you. But we also want to think about um, slang phrases that we can compare them to, to help associate meaning, a deeper meaning. Um, all right, substandard is another one. So I'm gonna copy these into the chat as we talk about them so we can go back to it. Um, so we have adequately, we have expenditures, we have, oops. Um, we also have, what was the last one I said? Oh, substandard, substandard. So, what do you think of those, those words? Substandard means below what is acceptable. So it's in some ways an antonym for adequately. Um, adequately is an adverb, substandard is an adjective, but if, uh, if I do something adequately, I do it well enough, right? I do it well enough. If uh, something is, so if I'm describing a noun, something is substandard, it's not good enough. So let's look at those words and let's see if we can come up with slang phrases for them. Or we can um, open it up in the chat properly. Also academic word, I would use that in an academic paper. Adequately, properly. Um, I properly clean the carpet. I adequately clean the carpet. Properly is stronger. Um, it might mean you did a better job, a slightly better job than if you do something adequately. Um, Expenditures is generally in plural form, um, like savings, yes. Um, I don't think, you might find a sentence that, that has it in singular. Um, you'd have to search for it, probably. Uh, it, their biggest expenditure, you might use it in the superlative adjective um, structure. Uh, our biggest expenditure on our vacation was airfare, was our plane ticket. In the superlative, you would use the singular for sure. Um, substandard, bad quality, there we go. So French Leo says bad quality. Um, that would be good, yeah, bad quality. To say something's bad quality, it's not good enough, those are slang type um, structures or slang phrases that have that meaning of substandard. So the other reason I wanted to um, teach class this way, teach academic vocabulary through a more casual um, look at slang and phrases is sometimes we have to do two translations if we do not speak English as a first language. Um, what we have to do is we have to think in English Right? But if, you, if your first language is, let's say, Chinese, for example, you're, you're thinking in Chinese if you're still a learner, then you have to think in English, and then you have to translate it to academic English. Because what you're exposed to most, unless you're a very diligent student, like some of our premium subscribers are, and you study, study, study all the time, more than likely, if you're practicing English on a casual level, you're talking to your friends, you're watching movies, you're watching television, which is not a perfect way to learn English for academic purposes. So you'll, you'll think of an idea and your English vocabulary for slang is probably bigger. So you have to translate it then into academic vocabulary. I have students type words like wanna in a sentence. Never, ever, ever type wanna in an academic paper. Okay, it's fine if you're messaging me on Facebook or um, if you're Snapchatting for your friends or something like that. That's fine to use wanna, gonna, shoulda, right? Um, shoulda, those, these, these kind of words are totally fine in casual conversation. Text message, it's great. Keep it out of your academic essay. 
It's not academic English. You don't want to do that. Um, your teachers will hand it back and say, no, no, you cannot do that. Um, <laughs> okay, so I know that you completely understand that, but um, something that can slip by a little bit easier is using a phrase like, um, uh, I want to remember it exactly. I think Vivek had it below standard, barely. Oh, um, it was uh, the French Leo. So bad quality. Bad quality is fine. Um, if you say something like, um, it, was, it was crummy quality, right? Something like that would be more casual. And you might, even if you say bad quality, bad quality is not slang, exactly. Um, it's a phrase that would be more often used casually though. So if you want to strengthen your essay, if you want to make it um, stronger, you will probably use a stronger word. And when we use very specific academic vocabulary words, we do it for the reason of it is the best word for the situation, for the context. You remember I spoke about context in a previous class, if you're, if you're a student who's been here with us for a while. Um, if we, we have to consider the context of our usage of English. So are you talking to your family, your grandmother, your friends, your, um, your professor, your teacher? If we speak with our friends, it probably is not exactly the same if we speak with our parents or grandparents, right? Um, Rosa says, I don't use informal English and sometimes I think that is bad. Yes, it can be, Rosa. Um, I think it's good to learn holistic English. Learn all of English. Learn casual English, where you can just hang out with your friends and use slang. It's fun. Um, but use it where it is appropriate. So use casual English on Facebook, text message, online, Skype, all of that, hangouts. And then use formal English in your writing, in your speeches, you can use a mixture of casual and formal English in speeches, but it depends on your audience, the context. Are you speaking to a group of world leaders? If you're speaking to a group of world leaders, you're talking to you know, President Obama and you're talking to um, someone of authority, right? You might use formal English to show respect, to show intelligence, to show um, that you understand the context of the situation. If you're talking to, you know, your, your friends on the street um, or as you're sharing a pizza, you're probably going to be more casual. You're going to say, hey, you know, what's going on? Good to see you. What's up? What's happening? So think about it that way. The only risk, Rosa, of um, using formal English in non-formal settings is sometimes people find it to be... Um, a little pompous or a little uh, as if you're arrogant and showing off, right? You're sort of um, boasting about the big words that you know. That can be troublesome. Um, sometimes English teachers like myself get in trouble for it because we know the words and we know that the words are better for the situation um, than something more casual because it's, it, it's impactful, it has meaning. So I'll use them sometimes with my family and they'll say, why are you using that you know, big fancy word? Um, so yes and no. Uh, sociolinguistics, absolutely. Yeah, that's where it comes into play. Okay, so um, let's talk about a new list. I wanna show, sort of show you a preview of some of the topics that you will study as a premium subscriber too. We talked about this one. This is poverty, the low income uh, measure, the basket measure. And we did a whole unit on that, if you've taken this class before, um, previous classes in this series. Um, this is a unit we have not got to. Um, this one is global warming or climate change. Um, so we have our academic word, his, word list here. Um, all right, so I'm going to look at this vocabulary, a smaller list size so I can zoom in. Um, 
I have to go. Okay, there's some good slang. Have to. Um, so that is the slang uh, way to type that. Have to is the proper way to do it. It's good to see you too, Yusuf. Uh, hello from Morocco. Uh, Surya. Surya, Surya. Hello, how are you? Um, okay, so teams, terms of academic context, we should use more formal language and in, avoid informal English like slang. Uh, yes, I'm going to correct your sentence there for you in the chat. In terms of academic context, we should use more formal language and avoid informal English like slang. Slang is an uncount noun. So we don't have slangs, just slang. Um, but you're right, your point is correct. Also capitalize the word English. Um, oh, something else I wanted to point out that I just noticed from a lot of our comments in the chat is we don't say, um, I speak, oops, sorry, that is my phone I forgot to silence. Um, okay, just going to put that on silent. All right. Um, we don't say, I speak English language, okay? We would say, or, or I use English language. If you use the word language, you need the definite article, the. So it's either, I speak the English language, which is um, sort of a just general factual statement, or I speak English, which is a better sentence. It's um, more economical, it's more efficient, you can use it in more situations. So don't put the word language after English unless you have the definite article, the. Um, good job, uh, Abderim. Abderim, is that how I say your name? I want to say it correctly. All right, uh, Jundi, hello, how are you? Good job, Vivek, good job. Um, okay. <laughs> we are talking about basic grammar, Victor, you're right. So let's go back into academic vocabulary. Of this list, of this list here, we have the word advent, atmosphere, carbon, climate, coal, correlation, dissipate, exacerbating, fusion, glacial, habitat, lumber, molten, organic, photons, radiation, substantial, thrive, unchecked, and wavelengths. Now some of this is esoteric to the science community. Photons, for example, um, radiation, wavelengths, glacial to, um, uh, well, geology or um, topography. Uh, but of the words that are not, of the words that could fit into many areas of um, academic writing, such as correlation. Correlation, what is a good synonym for correlation? And of the other words, do you want to know their definition? So look at this list, let me know in the chat. Jundi says, wow, those are fancy words. That's another word people use to describe academic vocabulary, fancy. And fancy is not a bad word. It means refined and, and nice and beautiful and big, right? Um, yes, they're fancy words. And sometimes you can use academic vocabulary, high-level vocabulary in slang situations. Um, so Rosa was talking about this a little bit. Um, what isn't a French word, Vivek? Which word? Let me know. Um, sometimes I see people spelling and pronouncing ya yeah instead of you. Uh, pronunciation, it's very common um, to say, oh yeah, what are you doing? What are ya doing? Meaning you, but that's slang pronunciation. That's very, very casual. You would not say that in an academic presentation. Um, so you would save that for your friends. Okay, let's see here. What other great questions do we have? Um, huh. Okay. Relationship between two things, Vivek. Yes, and correlation is not slang, it's academic. But um, can you think of a slang phrase or idiom that um, that has a similar meaning to correlation. 
Fancy words usually have the same meaning in Spanish and English. Yes, that's because of their roots. The larger words are usually chopped up over time and um, reduced, and they're made smaller. Not always. Sometimes they're made bigger um, or combined, like a portmanteau, um, but not always. This is science terminology, right, Rosa? This would be a science reading we would go over. I'm just giving you previews of different types of readings that we will do, and we will see these words in context, which is cool. Um, this is a nice, long reading that we'll go over later in this series. Um, okay, mixing of two things. There you go. There's a way to say a more casual um, uh, phrase that has um, a similar meaning. So let me go up to the top here. Okay, you were talking about um, probably comprised would be my guess. Correlation is not a mixing. Comprised is um, usually a mixing or, or better made up of, something that is made up of something else. I have no idea why that's still going off. It's on silent. Apologies. Sorry, guys. Um, I realized that the screen went dark there for a second. Okay, tried, one tried idiom. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, yaprak, yaprak. I hope that's how I say your name. Um, mathematical word. Um, I'm not sure which word you're talking about may be comprised. Let's look at another list and um, keep talking about these ones if you like. This is another academic reading on addiction. Um, so this talks about the um, levels of addiction and uses academic vocabulary in context. Addiction, appetite, cocaine, compulsion, crave, crystals, dependency, um, depressant, detrimental, entails, illicit, impulse, inhaled, neurotransmitters. So these are scientific terms as well. Um, but you can use words like tolerance, um, suppressant, thrill, you can use all of these in many, many, many academic vocabulary or academic um, essays and the context can be totally different. Um, th we are talking about drug effects. We, we don't have a list of completely legal vocabulary, but um, I do have a few group, word group lists that I've created for other students about legal vocabulary. And looks like um, Marcella, if you want to um, study those, if you're a premium subscriber, I can get them for you. Appetite zest. Oh, okay. <laughs> Rosa says appetite zest. Are you just talking about zest or appetite or those two together, Rosa? Because that would be an interesting combination of words. Appetite zest. Um, zest and zeal, um, those are good words that you can use. Um, Nora, what are boring? The uh, formal vocabulary words? Is that what you're talking about? Um, so Jundi's uh, example sentence is, it is estimated that around 4 million people in Indonesia are illicit drugs. Mm -mm. Um, you want a different verb there. Use or um, are under the influence of. You cannot say people are drugs because that means a person actually is a drug physically. Um, you can creatively say, oh, you know, that girl is my drug, meaning I'm addicted to this person, right? But that would be creative language and you probably would not do that in academic writing either. You can be creative but not huge metaphors, um, usually, especially in a scientific publication. Uh, the words are specific to write. Yes, so we don't necessarily use um, all of big, our big vocabulary words in spoken English, but there is a lot of overlap. So if this is academic writing and this is slang writing, there is a good amount of overlap. You can use them. It all depends on context. You're going to hear me say that a bunch in um, so many of my classes and on Facebook. Context, context, context. 
Um, a sentence or a word can be perfect in one moment and absolutely wrong in the next. It depends on the context. Um, okay, so that is another um, group of words. Here's another um, academic reading on homelessness. Um, these, again, some of them are esoteric words. Uh, do we know what that means? Esoteric. Let me, um, let me type this in the chat here for you. Um, all right, so esoteric, where is our chat? There we go, esoteric. Esoteric means um, a group of words or a list that is understood by fewer people than more. Um, for example, if you study botany, botany, the study of uh, plants, then you probably know a lot of words that are only um, applicable in the realm of plants. So someone who does not know scientific information about plants uh, may not know those terms. It is only for use in one context. Esoteric is an adjective that we use to describe word groups that are purposeful. They're for specific purposes, like legal terminology. Um, as I think Marcella said, legal terminology is um, very esoteric. I do not understand most legal terminology. But here's a good example where um, formal and slang combine. Have you ever watched a television show or a movie that was heavily involved in a legal situation? It's interesting. It's dramatic. So Hollywood makes movies about it. Well. Legal jargon um, oftentimes, and jargon is another word, it's a, it's a casual word to say esoteric language. Um, legal jargon is complicated, but it's a topic that is very popular in society, in movies and film and television. Um, so we will come up with slang phrases that have similar meaning in uh, the legal world. So that's a good example, actually. Steve, don't be sorry for being esoteric. This is the place to be esoteric and talk about um, you know, high level English and contextual English. This is the place. Uh, we do not use that word, Victor. Um, that is very British, very British. Uh, Nora is happy. Any advice, teacher? Okay, let me go back. Um, well, my first advice as I'm going back looking for your question is, Usually you don't call teachers teacher. Um, and this is, a, this is a class where I teach students how to be good university students, college students. So this is something I should address too. Um, it's okay, I'm, I'm not gonna care if you, if you call me teacher, you can if you want. But you should know um, most students who are native English speakers in America or Canada do not say at the university level, teacher, uh, teacher, I have a question. Teacher, can I talk to you? No. The way that you address someone in a university in America um, is you, you usually call them by their title, if it's doctor or professor um, or mister or missus um, or miss. You just address them by their title or, and then last name. So it'd be like Dr. Porter, Professor Porter, Mr. Porter for me. Um, Mr. Professor, same thing. That's like calling someone teacher, um, French Leo. Isn't it informal? Yes, it's informal to call someone just by their name if they're in a position of authority. Um, like if I met Barack Obama, I wouldn't say, hey Barack. Like I wouldn't say that. I would say, hello President Obama. I would be very formal because I would show him respect. You know, he's the, the president. Um, Big Bang is good, and they use a lot of esoteric scientific words, um, esoteric to the scientific community, but they sort of mix it with slang. So that's a good, good show to watch, if, especially if you're into sciences. Um, but I'm going back to your question here. Um, I just got on a tangent about the whole teacher thing. So normally if you start a class, you would say, um, 
the professor would say, hello, my name is Professor Porter, or hello, my name is Mr. Porter. Whatever I introduce myself as, you should call me, call me that, right? So if you guys go to your university class and you sit down and you're like, <clears throat> and then your, your teacher comes in and they say, hello students, my name is Professor Porter. I am here to teach you. Uh, it's very formal for someone to you know, speak like that, but some of your professors or instructors will speak like that. Uh, for me, uh, I'm a little more casual with my students. I say, just call me Josh, call me Joshua, that's fine. You don't have to call me mister. You don't have to call me you know, professor, instructor, anything like that, don't. Just call me Josh or Joshua. Those are both good. Um, <laughs> and don't use a title and a first name. Don't say Mr. Joshua or Mr. Josh or um, don't say Professor Josh or Teacher Josh, none of that. If you wanted to use the word Mr., you would use my last name, my family name. So Porter is mine. So it would be Mr. Porter, um, not Mr. Joshua. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And I'm not saying this because I want you to call me one thing or another. I really don't care. It doesn't matter. It's, it's totally fine. You can call me anything you want. Um, hey, you dorky guy with, uh, with a jacket on. That's fine. Um, but what I do want you to know is if you go to a university setting, you should be prepared so that you do not look silly um, in front of other students. If you go there and there's a bunch of Americans sitting around you and you say, teacher, they're going to have a low opinion of you and your English abilities because that's not what you would say in English naturally. Um, so I want to teach you natural, functional, useful English. That's my goal here. So please know that. You can call me anything you want, but uh, if you go to a university, I want you to, to sound like a, an American speaker, a native American English speaker. So that's my goal for you. Um, okay, French Leo's gonna call me Josh. Aaron's gonna call me Mr. Porter, eh. Uh, hi, sir. Sir is okay. Um, don't say Sir Joshua, that means I'm knighted. Like Sir Elton John, um, Benedict Cumberbatch. I want to speak like Benedict Cumberbatch. Well, I have an American accent. Benedict Cumberbatch, he has an English accent, so he talks like this sometimes. I'm terrible at accents. Um, but you should watch a lot of Sherlock then, probably. I would say and try to, try to mimic Benedict's accent, his voice. All right, um, I still need to get to this question. You want to ask something. Um, this is Abderhim. Abderhim. Uh, I want to ask something. I'm a university student and I forgot words and vocabulary so easily. Is there any way to keep my knowledge fresh? Yes, there is. So, um, different learning styles for different students. Um, something I've done and some of our premium subscribers have done. I know Rosa has. She sent me awesome little phone photos of uh, flashcards that she created that are similar to the ones that I used in, um, in college. So if I'm learning another language, if I'm learning Japanese or French or you know, Spanish or anything else, um, what I will do is I will take flashcards, like this size piece of paper, it's hard to see, um, this size piece of paper, and I will write notes on them. I will write um, the word and then the meaning. So word and definition. Or, um, you know, French word, English word. Or um, sometimes French word, English word, definition in English. Something like that. I will write notes for myself um, and then I will go through them. So I'll have a stack like this big of note cards and I'll go through them and I'll make two piles. One and two. I know it, I don't know it. Even if I remember the word, like the, the translation, but I don't remember the definition, I'll put it in the I don't know it pile. And then I'll go through. Okay, word, 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 word. And then at the end, the stack of cards, which is always smaller, that I do know, I'll put to the side. And I will take the stack of cards that I don't know, which is always bigger, um, at first, 
and I'll go through it again and I'll do the same thing. Oh yeah, I remember this one now. I don't remember this one. Okay, know it, don't know it, to make two piles. And then at the end of that, I'll take that again, stack of words I know and put it over here and pick up the cards I don't know and do it again. Um, that's a really long, laborious process, but it works for me. I remember it if I can repeat those words. Um, that is one way to do it. Now, I did that a long time ago when I was learning language and when I was learning medical terms, when I worked in pharmacy. Um, so there's, there's situations to use something like that, a strategy like that, and then there's situations to do something different. Um, what I'm a big fan of now, after doing more research, more study, is visual lexicon. Visual lexicon. I'm very glad, uh, Sarbajit, that you can easily understand my accent. I have a very neutral accent. It's very American. And if you want to speak like um, your average American speaker, you should mimic my voice. Try to, to speak like I do. Um, okay, we have so many great questions here. Flashcards are use useful for visual learners. More than visual learners though, people who learn visually, um, human learning, uh, a lot of science that, and research that has been done to see how we save knowledge, how, we, how human memory works, whether you're um, a visual learner, an auditory learner, um, a tactile learner, you have to get up and be kinesthetic, be moving around. Um, associating a mental image it doesn't have to be something right in front of you. To learn coffee cup, I don't need to see this cop coffee cup. I just need to imagine it. And if you imagine a word, you are more likely to use it. Um, let's try a difficult word. Let's try a really esoteric word. Um, hmm. First e. Let's do neurotransmitter. Okay, does anyone know, don't, don't Google it, don't translate it, don't do anything, just listen to the word I pronounce and tell me if you know the meaning. What is a neurotransmitter? Neurotransmitter, what is that? Um, let's see if anybody can answer in the chat and I'm gonna go through the questions here and make sure I'm answering them all. Um, uh, Let's see. I want to speak English like a native speaker, and I want to be brave when I am talking about something with somebody. Good, you're in the right place, how to. That's, that's what we want you to do. Um, mimic my voice if you want to speak like a native speaker, and I and the other students here will help you become comfortable using English. All right, Nitesh is here. Um, Vivek says, Mr. Porter, may I see you for lunch in this great afternoon? If you're in Spokane, Washington, yeah, let's totally get lunch, Vivek. I'd love to do that. Um, all right. Read an hour a day, French Leo says. Yes, reading is a very good way to learn vocabulary. If you have high level English ability, read the New York Times. Um, the New York Times, or, um, or if you want something creative, the New Yorker, those are good publications to expand your vocabulary. They are known for using um, advanced vocabulary. Okay. Lie detector, kind of. Uh, no, transmission through the brain. Akram has a good definition. A device to transmit something in the brain, exchange something, transmission between neurons. Yes, okay. Um, oh, my accent and Benedict's are beautiful, thank you. So transmission of nerve impulse between two brain cells. Anka, uh, looks like, my guess is maybe you had a definition in front of you, maybe you Googled it, yeah, no? Um, neural transmitter, something about nerves. Good, okay, so everybody has a general idea. But if it's a new word to you, so who is this a new word to? It looks like, um, who said, who said something about 
transmitting something, exchange something. That's a good guess. So abragus, um, it looks like that's a new word for you. That's good. Something related to the brain. Um, let me see. Oh, you're a doctor. That explains it. <laughs> of course. Good job. Um, I wanted to find somebody who didn't know the word is my goal. Um, there's so many wonderful uh, phrases and chats going on here. Okay. Well, here's, here's my point. Um, same word in French. Okay, French, Leo. Um, so it, this might be the same word in many languages. My point is neurotransmitter, if this is a new word for you, um, what I'd like you to do is just look at this image that I'm about to bring up. Um, I'm going to, so a neurotransmitter, it is, it's a special message, it's chemicals enabling um, signals across a synapse, which is a space between neurons. But um, let's say all I have to really know about neurotransmitters is it is communication in the brain. Um, so I'm going to try to find a very simple image, simple, simple image. And I'm looking for something specific. So it might take me just a second here. Um, let's see. Uh, I might not be able to find exactly what I'm looking for. I can make it for you though. Um, even if I just put two images next to each other. So if I, here we go. This is kind of what I'm looking for. Um, an image like this, something, um, something that is very simple, a brain and a satellite dish. And depending on your schema, what you understand, what you've been exposed to in life, you may or may not um, know this image as a satellite, but probably, you know, um, we're all familiar with something sort of like this. If a different image makes more sense to you, use that image, like a telephone or um, something. Communication is the point. So what, I, what you might do too is try to study the word neurotransmitter and look at this image and make that association. Um, if you can conjure a mental image and associate it strongly with a word, you are more likely to retain that knowledge. Um, there's a lot of evidence for it. You can research it on your own if you like. But it is one way that I encourage my students to understand definitions. Now you have to make sure the, the image that you associate the word with has appropriate meaning and it is something that will conjure um, the exact definition. That is important. But if we can do that, we can better save that knowledge in our minds. Okay? So uh, we have a lot of questions here. I'm not going to get to all of them where you can find free English through Skype. Nope, sorry. I mean, doubt it. If you can befriend an English speaker and Skype with them on a regular basis, um, possibly. A good, good way to do it would be like join some Facebook groups and, and make friends and practice with them. But I don't know anywhere that does free Skype English. Um, let's see. Uh, chemical transfer, yeah, okay. I'm glad you like my accent. Uh, okay. Neuromediator, Vivek. Yeah, I like the sound of that too. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up for today. We're going to do more um, vocabulary associations and we'll probably go into a contextual example um, next class. So you can still reach us on Learn English on Facebook um, and we're going to finish a vocabulary portion and then transition into contextual portion next week. Um, so same time next week, Thursday. 
um, at 15.30, no, not 15.30, is it? I have to look at the schedule again. Um, let me check out our schedule. I want to make sure I give you the right time. It's 7.30 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. Yeah, okay. 15.30 um, Greenwich Mean Time. So 15.30 Greenwich Mean Time or um, uh, 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So thank you all for being here. Um, share the stream with your friends, like Zach says. And thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching uh, today's episode, today's uh, um, portion in the series. Uh, like I said, come back next week because we're going to go into contextual usage of um, some of this academic vocabulary. Also, uh, premium subscribers, your homework for the week is I would like you to come up with 10 academic vocabulary words or phrases and slang counterparts. So 10 academic vocabulary words and phrases and their slang counterparts, okay? So please, premium subscribers, um, submit 10 academic vocabulary words. <laughs> oh, Zach was knighted. That's awesome. Congratulations, Zach. Uh, premium subscribers submit 10 academic vocabulary words or phrases um, and um, slang counterparts. Okay, so that's your homework for premium subscribers. If you're not a premium subscriber, um, check it out. Uh, Sarbajit says, can we Google them? Try to not Google them. Try to do it on your own, but absolutely, if you cannot um, think of a slang phrase, um, or if you just want to search for slang phrases first and work backwards, try to find academic vocabulary words or phrases that are counterparts to those slang phrases and words. That is cool too. If you have questions, of course, email me. Um, everybody there should have my email. It's joshua.live at um, smartenglish.com. If you want to become a premium subscriber, talk to Zach. He's here. He's hanging out with us. Really appreciate it, Zach. Thank you. Um, and I'm just making sure I'm getting everybody's questions right before I leave beginning or continuing from a previously taught lesson. So Adam, uh, we are going to start um, from where we left off before and keep going forward. So if you are a previous premium subscriber, you're going to get new information. Um, if you want to review something from before, we can, uh, because for many students it will be new, but we're gonna keep going forward. So you're gonna see new readings, new topics, new contextual usage of academic vocabulary. So I hope that helps and answers your question. Alejandra, bye, thank you. Um, French Leo, bye, au revoir, ciao. <laughs> um, Vivek, see you in the group, bye, have a good day. Rosa, enjoy Sean's class tomorrow. Uh, really glad you stayed with us and come back for writing essays when your English advances, okay? Um, Yes, uh, Sarbajit, you will share your homework. It doesn't have to be today, but please share it with me by Wednesday of next week. Okay, so before Wednesday. Um, if you do it today, share it today. If you do it uh, over the weekend, share it over the weekend, okay? Have a wonderful day, Marcella. Thank you for being here. Um, Yaprak, bye. See you later. And thanks again, everybody. So, Nora. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you and have a good day. Um, looks like I saw most of the questions there. I think we're good. Oh, Rosie, you lost the internet. I'm sorry, but uh, email me and, and check the chat. I put homework in there, okay? Uh, so everybody, have a great day. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, and I will see everybody next Tuesday, 7.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. 15.30 um, Greenwich Mean Time.
Okay, so thanks so much. As always, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.